my uh, uh, father came in about 1913 uh, and uh, with him by himself. He wasn't, he wasn't married then. And uh, he came to, uh, I think, Georgia to start with and then came to Seattle. And, uh, and then a couple of years earlier, he went back to the, the Island Road. That's where he was born and raised. And uh, married my mother and they both came back. They were very, very much involved from day one with the Ezra Becerra. They started uh, early on, uh, before the Ezra Becerra was really formed, and together they uh, met with all, a lot of the people that they knew from Rhodes. And uh, they, I forget the name of the hall, but they would meet for high holidays, a meeting in this hall. And, uh, and uh, the Jewish community, the Sephardic coming from, would meet every uh, on occasion, Sundays and Saturdays and whatever, and high holidays, of course. And uh, well, finally, they were kicked out of that area, and uh, they went ahead and decided to build a synagogue. And they did, I think, on 16th or 17th, and uh, and the fur. Dad was very much involved. My mother, of course, was late as auxiliary. She was president of this organization, and. Uh, uh, they worked very hard and they, all the people around here were friends, people that she knew for many years from the old country as well. They had five boys, uh, Reuben, uh, Ralph, Victor, Orville, Esau. My father was actually born in the house on 24th and Yesa. And they were raised there and went to the synagogue uh, on 1st Street, on uh, 17th and 1st Street, the 1st Desert Becerra. And uh, I anyway, we, we went to a meeting on Sunday at the, at the synagogue. He'd take me with him once in a while. And you know, they're all friends. They, uh, all the men knew each other and whatever. And they go up on the second floor and start talking. And I'm a little kid there. And the next time I heard, they were screaming at each other. And that this guy didn't want to do this, and the other guy jet did little swear words as well, frankly. And I said, they're going to have a fight, something's going to happen. When the meeting was over with, they came on, arm in arm, laughing, smoking cigars like nothing happened, you know. My father went to Rainier Elementary School, uh, met my mother, um, and they also went to Garfield High School. And my father went on to the service in the uh, United States Navy and uh, went to war in uh, World War II, came back and married my mother at the uh, synagogue on First Street, Ezra Becerra, and uh, went back to war. Uh, I was in the Navy for uh, maybe four years, and when I got out, we continued the relationship uh, with the synagogue. From early on, uh, he followed his father's steps and uh, as a role model, he was very involved with the synagogue. In 1947, we sold the old building. But uh, when we sold the old synagogue, uh, uh, where do we go? And we were going to build a new building in the um, Seward Park. In the case of Ezra Becerra, it was in the center of town, downtown, and the idea of coming to Seward Park and creating a building with a facility that would house eventually a sanctuary was something that was really a little bit far-fetched and beyond people's grasp. People who were uh, very well respected in the community said, I'm sorry, we can't do it, you know, that attitude. We objected to that, that we can't do it. Is that everything that can't do it? There's no such thing I can't do. We can do it. It's necessary. We have to do it. One can wait till all the resources are in place and then little by little incrementally build that community. Or a person can start with a vision uh, along the lines of, if you build it, they will come. And uh, I think Orville Cohn is an example of a kind of a person who took the vision and put that forward and then encouraged everybody else to sort of lift themselves up and then mobilize themselves towards that vision. A couple of us located the lots that we have the synagogue on and we bought the property for twenty thousand dollars next thing i would worry about the piece of property we have here was purchased 
and they wanted to build something on it, but didn't have the money, the know-how. They didn't know where to start. Orville was very active in the construction business at the time, and therefore he played a major role in the construction and the development of the site. Uh, he used a lot of his connections with architects and with banks and financiers to help with the various committees and of course a lot of help from the Ezra Becerath and all of the uh, constituents and members at the Ezra Becerath but uh, during that process dad was a real organizer <clears throat> he did what it took to organize and get the committees going and make it happen. We had many many meetings I mean uh, it started at six, seven o'clock in the evening till 12 midnight three days a week sometimes you know uh, you know, uh, Eleanor Bihar was here, and um, Morris Tarika, who would become president one day, and uh, trying to put things together, and we never gave up. All of us, all of us got together and studied and worried about what we're going to do and what the next step would be. And there was a lot of controversy, but we made it work. He worked with all of the many founders, if you will, and of course the uh, people of the synagogue. We had a vision, and Orville had that special touch of of being able to put those thoughts into actuality. I got up and made some kind of a speech, and um, the, more of the congregation, the men and women, had listened to what we were going to do because they were concerned also. I uh, went ahead and I said, I'm going to hear smoke cigarettes. At the time, everyone smokes cigarettes, it seems. And everyone raised their hand and said, all right. How much a cigarette? 25 cents a package or thereabout. I said, well, we have a little can here. See the car, and you put it 25 cents every day, it will make this thing work. And uh, everyone could believe that, and that we had a bunch of cans and whatever. But anyway, bottom line, they, they fell for it and that this is fine, it, it'll work, it'll work. And that was a good start. And they started putting money, other people put in much more than that, of course. But it, it was great help, they were enthusiastic about wanting to do something, and they did. And we thank everybody that was involved because without them we would have nothing, you know. But there were two parts, one the all-purpose building here, and then the synagogue. So we didn't have money to do both, so we started with the all-purpose building. And uh, we didn't have a dime to speak of. We knew that if we came in with all-purpose hall, with the lower level and the classrooms, that the people would want to the sanctuary, whereas if we built the sanctuary first, that probably would have been what we ended up with. Let's build the all-purpose building and then use that as a synagogue. And then one day, maybe two or three, four years, we'll be the synagogue. And uh, that was the only direction that we had at that point. We had a big grand opening and everyone was just happy that we had what, what we did have. But that day was just a, a great day. All of that space month. Yeah, after we used that for quite a few years, it was time to go into building the sanctuary. And we had to borrow money, which we did. And special people signed personally. And <clears throat> and uh, we have many uh, uh, affairs with raised money, and and it worked. We'd spend a lot more money for this one, obviously. Obviously. You see all this marble stuff here. What you see above you, that wasn't easy. And wasn't, uh, they were very uh, costly by comparison to do phase one, if you will. The synagogue picked out some very ornate uh, mosaic glass, artistic glass, in the synagogue in many locations. And it was very expensive. Uh, Orwell uh, pulled together with his brothers and they in fact uh, funded the entire glass of all the synagogue in all in all the synagogue and um, that was a, a major uh, expense uh, prior to opening the sanctuary the synagogue was short funds some of the interiors weren't quite done and uh, my father with his cousin uh, Samuel dr. Samuel Tarika uh, got together and donated a major donation, each of them, 
and it's signified by the keys that are over the uh, front doors in the foyer. Final product was tremendous. The sanctuary, and when you look around you, you just see the glory and the glamour of the of the of the enterprise. You get a sense that something very important is going on here, and that is the sort of the second phase of the Orville Cone dream, the vision that went from a building, a multi-purpose room, to a beautiful sanctuary that inspires and delights. You can look everywhere in this synagogue, in this structure, and you can see where he has personally had a hand and a touch. The synagogue today shows his diligence to the tradition of our Sephardic heritage by the way he has put the synagogue together. It shows his touches in the style, the functionality, and of course, the color schemes throughout this entire synagogue. And there could have been a more capable and respected person to handle the terrific endeavor that we were going into and to develop the new synagogue and sanctuary. Uh, you know, he kind of follows the Ezra Becerath, uh, help and need and when the Ezra Becerath actually needed help, Dad was there to finance, emotionally, physically, whatever it took, Dad was there to help. All one has to do, all one has to do is walk to the front door of the foyer of the sanctuary and you will see a very simple sign. And that sign says, from Vicki and Orville Cohn, in love and in memory of our parents, Salvatore and Serena. That indicates the kind of beautiful uh, feeling and sense of tradition Orville has, not only from a family, but from the family of the synagogue. We, we, we look back, we looked at and found out what we had, starting with, with the 14th and Yesler, what they did before we were around, so to speak. And then the synagogue was the 17th, and then here, just a great accomplishment, no, no, there's no doubt about that. But we didn't say, other than talk about casually, what they had versus what they have now. We, we're talking about today, and we're happy, so happy that it worked today for all of us. He's the kind of empire builder and the cornerstone of our community that is a wonderful role model for our family as well as our community. And even if we don't ourselves have the exact same degree of resources or connections that a person like Orville had when he built Ezra Becerra here in Seward Park, everybody on his or her own level can make an incremental change, can make a dent, and can move the community forward by taking the cue from a person like Orville Cohn. A lot of people that are coming, frankly, that are new members, so to speak, that, that don't know what you know, when I don't. And uh, they're comfortable.